I don't believe in ghost stories or urban legends, but walking down those deserted streets of Belgrade that night, something felt off. The Serbian dancing lady. What a laughable joke, right? That creepy story that went viral on TikTok. People saying they had seen her all alone, dancing in the streets, turning around street lights with a knife. A legend tells that she could run after any person who came too close. But come on, just a joke, I said to myself. I am Luca, a journalist. What I enjoy the most is debunking hoaxes like this. Naturally, I had decided to follow up on this story after it began to go viral on cyberspace. It was almost midnight and I packed my bags with a camera in hand, hoping to catch whatever hoax this was in frame. But the streets of Belgrade lay deathly quiet beneath me, a stillness that reached down into your skin. Just two strays scurried past as I made my way down to the alley where she had last been spotted. The air was heavy, cold seeping into my bones as I tried to shake off the nerves building inside. All you could hear was my footsteps, at least each step echoing down cobblestones. I arrived at the alley and stopped there, pulling out my camera. Let's see if this ghost lady's real, I told myself, more to try to keep myself from freaking out than anything else. I began filming street scenes, speaking into the camera. Nothing so far, probably just... Then I heard it. Music, very soft, as if from nowhere and everywhere at the same time. The wind was carrying it on its breath. My chest tightened as I slowly turned my head. It was then that I saw her. He stood at the end of the street, where it seemed a dangling street lamp cast just enough light to illuminate his stand. The girl danced, that's the only word for it. No, she swayed in a long, sweeping gown. Her movements were slow and eerily mesmerizing, as though lost in another world. My breath caught in my throat. No, this cannot be real. It wasn't possible, but it was. She spun, arms weaving around her body beatifically, but something was wrong in the movement. Too staccato, too conscious. My hands were shaking as I raised the camera and zoomed in on her. The lens fought to find its focus, but it was enough. She was a woman, and she was dancing. Then she stopped, quite suddenly. She looked up at me if she had just realized I was staring at her. My heart was pounding, and everything in my body screamed to run away, but my feet were glued onto the floor. She sat there in the shadows and stared at me. She was hiding her face behind hers, but I could feel eyes on me. The air was thick and suffocating as I stood there, too scared to move. Then she started walking towards me. Dancing was over fluid moment gone. Now it was a slow, deliberate walk, as if she were advancing directly for me. I tried to take one step back, but my legs would not go. Was this real? Was this some sort of demented trick? I looked down at her hand and saw there, it was glinting in the dim light, a knife. Then something inside me snapped. My head was screaming at me to move. I turned around and fled, pounding my feet on pavement and my heart in my ears. It was as if the sound of my heart beating in time created an urgency that drowned her. However, underneath it, I heard her footsteps slumbering, slow, deliberate, steady, as if she knew exactly where I was going. I chanced to glance over my shoulder. She was still there, darkly silhouetted, moving with an efficiency to be toward me the knife catching every step of light. I ran faster, turning down haphazard streets, my gasping breath coming raggedly as I tried to shake her. Every time I seemed to have lost her, I could hear her still, the soft tapping of her shoes against cobblestones. I ran down the alley, getting behind a dumpster to crouch down for breath. My hands were shaking as I held my camera. I tried to stand still. I need proof. This is not just some stupid joke. I hit record again, peeking over the dumpster. Her face was hidden once more behind the overhanging wall, but I felt sure she saw me. I waited, holding my breath to ensure she would not come forward any farther. For a few agonizing moments, we just stayed locked in this pose, as if me crouching there in the shadows and she stared straight at me. And then, slowly, she turned and walked away, vanishing into the darkness again. 
I waited, my heart pounding wildly, could not piece together what had occurred. Was it done? I didn't know. It took all that was left of me to stand up, my legs shaking as I stumbled from the alley. The streets were empty again, and the morbid music was gone. Had I dreamed it? No, I couldn't do that. I had it on film. Back in my apartment, I replayed the tape. There she was, dancing, then walking straight for me. But something made my stomach drop. In the video, as she danced under the streetlight, she wasn't looking at me. She was looking behind me? A chill slid down my spine, and before I could do anything about it, my phone buzzed. On my screen was a text from an unknown caller. You should have left her alone. A chill went through my neck. I was no longer alone. Not anymore. I never thought my life would spiral into a nightmare that felt ripped from a thriller novel. My name is Marsha, and I'm a 24-year-old swimsuit model based in Miami. With sun-kissed skin and long, wavy brown hair, I've always loved the ocean and the freedom it brings. Modeling seemed like a natural path. My family, however, didn't share my enthusiasm, especially Liam, my older brother. Ever since I started modeling, he'd warned me about the sickos and creeps in the industry. My dad was equally overprotective. Our conversations often ended in tense silence. I brushed off his concerns as typical sibling worry, not realizing how he was actually right. One afternoon, as I lounged on my balcony overlooking the bustling streets below, my phone buzzed. A Snapchat notification from an account named Watcher7. Odd. I didn't recall adding anyone by that name. The message read, Hope you like the gift I sent. Confused, I ignored it, assuming it was a misdirected message or some spam. Days went by and I forgot about the odd snap until a thick envelope appeared at my doorstep. Inside were printed photos, pictures of me from my private Snapchat stories. My heart raced. How did someone get those? Worst yet, it was Liam who received the envelope. This is exactly what I was warning you about. You need to quit this modeling nonsense and focus on something real. You think this is about modeling? Someone invaded my privacy. Our argument escalated. Liam stormed out, leaving me alone with a mix of fear and frustration. The snaps from Watcher 7 continued. Photos of me on dates with guys I'd met online. Candid shots from across restaurants. Even grainy images of me through hotel windows. Each one sent chills down my spine. How was someone following me so closely without me noticing? One night, as I returned to my apartment, I sensed something was off. The air felt heavy. I glanced around. My favorite seashell necklace was on the coffee table, though I swore I'd left it in my bedroom. The window was slightly ajar, letting in a cool breeze that fluttered the curtains. Hello? Is anyone here? Silence. I checked every room, every closet. Nothing. But the unease lingered. Desperate for help, I reached out to Alex, an IT guy I'd been chatting with on a dating app. We went out a few times, clicked, but never really dated. Alex, I think someone's stalking me. They have access to my private snaps and photos of me everywhere I go. That's serious. We need to check your devices and security at home. He came over the next day, bringing equipment to scan for any breaches. As he waved a device around my bedroom, it beeped near a bookshelf filled with travel guides and old photo albums. Huh, there's something here. We pulled the shelf away to reveal a tiny camera, meticulously hidden between the books. Oh my god. How did that get there? Whom does it belong to? Let me try to find out. He worked his tech magic, and within minutes, he looked up, eyes wide. The IP address it's connected to, it's local, very local. What do you mean? It's coming from your place, like your father's place. Anyone in your family who could have easy access to the cameras? My... my father. He works in security. I felt the room spin. That couldn't be right. 
My father was protective, yes, but this? Determined to confront him, I drove to our parents' house and confronted my dad, but he just looked flummoxed. He swore on his dead mother that he did not do it, but then, almost instantly, all of us understood that it could only be Liam. I found him in the garage, tinkering with his motorcycle. Why are you spying on me? He looked up, expression unreadable. I don't know what you're talking about. Don't play dumb. I found the camera, the photos. It's all coming from you. His facade cracked. Well, you weren't listening. I had to make you see the dangers. This was for your own good. You've been stalking me. Our father, a quiet man with graying hair and tired eyes, stepped in after me. Liam's face twisted with anger. She's throwing her life away. Someone had to protect her. Father's gaze hardened. Without warning, our father slapped Liam across the face. In about 10 minutes, I will call 911. You have that much time to gather whatever it is that you need and get out from my home. That is all you deserve from me. Liam glared at both of us, eyes wild. You'll regret this. He shoved past me, storming out of the garage. I stood there, tears streaming down my face. How did I not see this coming? My father simply hugged me, a comfortable warm hug. It has been over four years now since we saw Liam. I am a successful model. I still visit my dad frequently, and I am just trying to heal, surrounded by genuine people who care. I saw Alex for some time, but it didn't work out. We're still good friends, but Liam remained a shadow in my past, a reminder of how quickly brotherly love can turn into something dark and dangerous. I never imagined that moving to Pinebrook would become a test of my resilience. My name is Anita, a 28-year-old accountant who recently immigrated from India. I was eager to start my new job at a small accounting firm nestled in this quaint town. On my first day, I stepped into the office, a stuffy room filled with aged white men who paused their conversations as I entered. Their eyes followed me, a mix of curiosity and disdain. One man smirked. You're a bit different from what we're used to around here. I forced a smile, trying to ignore the knot forming in my stomach. Work was isolating. My colleagues offered little assistance, and lunchtime was a solitary affair. I often ate at my desk, poring over spreadsheets while overhearing whispered conversations centered around my skin color. After work, I drove along the winding highway back to my rented house on Maple Street. One evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, I noticed a black sedan pull onto the road behind me. Thinking nothing of it, I continued driving, but had a feeling that it was following me. Then, the next night, and the one after that, the same sedan appeared, maintaining a steady distance all the time. I took a different exit, but it followed. I routed back to my original path, and it followed yet again. The unease grew. Then, three nights later, the sedan inched closer, its headlights glaring into my rearview mirror. My palms grew sweaty as I gripped the steering wheel. I had heard incidents of racial attacks in these parts. Stay calm. Just get home. The sedan suddenly flashed its high beams, blinding me. I swerved slightly and stopping to the side. But by then, just as abruptly, it sped off into the darkness. Now at home, things weren't much better. My neighbors seemed to harbor an unexplained animosity. Their trash bags appeared outside my front door, torn open with garbage strewn across the porch. When I walked to the same site that night, I decided to confront them and walked up to ring their doorbell. An old man on a wheelchair opened the door and stared at me with disdain. Excuse me, I believe all that trash belongs to you. He looked at the trash outside my house and just shrugged his shoulders. My wife throws the trash, so only she'll be able to tell you when she returns from the church. Maybe you should mind your own business. I'd appreciate if my property was respected from now on. Or else, I'll have to call the police. He sneered. Why don't you do that right now, honey, and see how far that gets you? 
He casually slapped my behind and then closed the door on my face. I was left horrified. After a few days, the black sedan followed me again, and then again the next night. Each time, it followed a bit closer, almost looking like it would hit me. Then, one night, after having a particularly hard day at work, I arrived at my home to find the black sedan outside, and my mailbox had been knocked over. I was paralyzed. It stood for just some time before screeching its tires and rushing away. I found a note in my fallen mailbox, which said, Leave town now. That next day at work, I overheard a conversation. She doesn't belong here. Taking jobs from real Americans. Cole was fired because she does his job for half the pay. My presence was met with cold stares and silence. The isolation was suffocating. That night, I received a voicemail from an unknown number. A raspy whisper filled the line, which announced the creative ways in which people of color had disappeared in that area, and I might as well. Sleep eluded me. Every creak of the house amplified my paranoia. Around midnight, a tapping sound echoed from the living room window. I crept downstairs, clutching a kitchen knife. Peering through the curtain, it was raining outside. And then, I don't know if it was just a hallucination, but I saw someone with long hair trying to look inside. Just as I turned the lights on, he vanished. This can't go on. The next morning, I discovered my car tire slashed. That was the breaking point. I went to the police station, half expecting dismissal due to my color. Officer Miller listened without paying much attention, and it felt like he had brushed my concern. Well, you look into it. Just two days later, as I drove home, the black sedan appeared once more. My heart hammered as it closed the distance. Suddenly, police lights flashed behind us. The sedan accelerated, attempting to flee, and the police car chased it. It was soon cornered by patrol cars. I pulled over, watching as cops led by Officer Miller approached the vehicle. A young man with long hair was pulled out, protesting vehemently and flipping like a fish out of water. Officer Miller approached me. We got him. Relief washed over me, but it was short-lived. The next day, someone knocked on my door. It was Mrs. Jenkins, my elderly next-door neighbor. Her long silver hair fell till her shoulders, and her dark eyes studied me intently. You've caused quite a stir in our community. I'm sorry? My son lost his job at that accounting firm. Worked there for years. Then you showed up. Now he's out on the street. I'm sorry about your son, but I had nothing to do with that. Her lips curled into a sneer. You people come here, taking what's ours. I won't stand for it. A chill ran down my spine. Are you saying you're behind the harassment? She leaned in. I did what was necessary to protect my family. You could have quit and went away. But now, because of you, my son is in jail. This is illegal. You can't threaten me. She scoffed. Who's going to believe you over a respected member of this community? Just then, Officer Miller appeared at the doorway. Actually, uh, we will. Mrs. Jenkins' face paled. Your son told us what you've been up to, ma'am. You're under arrest for harassment and conspiracy. As they led her away, I stood there, shaking. The pieces fell into place. The stalking, the threats, all orchestrated by someone who appeared harmless. In the days that followed, the town was abuzz with gossip. Some looked at me with sympathy, others with resentment. At work, the atmosphere shifted slightly, but within some months, I applied for another job and left the town. Me and Emily were like inseparable. She came to my house that evening, just like a million times before. We talked, laughed, and shared secrets. When she left, the sun was already low down, turning the crisp autumn air chilly on our skin. I stood there at the door, waving to see her disappear at the end of the street. The last light of the day faded slowly as it disappeared behind her. 
I didn't know that the next time I'd ever see her would be the last time as the Emily I knew. It had been a few days into the school year when all hell let loose in our little town of Crestwood. Emily didn't make it home. Everyone joined the search. I was there too, flashlight in hand, yelling her name into the thick darkness of the woods. Hours turned into days, and there was no sign of her. Throughout it all, I was stuck on what if she's hurt? What if she's cold and scared? But nothing could have prepared me for what they eventually found. Two days went by, and a ranger discovered Emily stuck in a cave deep within the forest. I could hear it, and ran as fast as my legs could carry. What I see is etched into my memory now forever. She sat there, a weird big smile on her face and completely white eyes. Something was seriously wrong. It wasn't Emily anymore. It was just as if someone or something else had replaced her. The ranger called the police right away, but all I could do was stand there with my heart pounding in my chest. Her parents soon arrived, equally aghast. Emily sat there, still grinning, still silent, with white eyes staring right through us. She was taken to the hospital, but something dark had already taken hold of her. I visited her the next day, hoping for some explanation, some indication of the girl I grew up with, and the things went even darker in turn. She had her fit in the hospital. I was in the corridor when it happened. I heard screaming, thrashing about, and then... Quite suddenly, a nurse bursts out of the room with blood running down her arm. Emily had bitten the nurse. The woman had to have her sedate Emily. She was chained to the bed. Her father, John, was beside himself. He refused to believe all the stories of dark rituals or possession going the rounds in town. But then she heard a whisper from her mother, Linda, saying that something evil had taken her daughter. John wouldn't take that. He resumed his investigation, tracing down Emily's moves, and that's where they found the CCTV footage. I remember watching that with them. Three people, dressed in animal masks and black robes, carrying Emily into the woods. It made my stomach twist to take it. Linda was of the opinion they must have used Emily in some dark occult ritual, but John refused to believe in Hocus Pocus, as he called it. Emily was allowed to go home after seven days in the hospital. John ensured his friend Dr. Roberts, a psychiatrist of considerable repute, would visit to conduct a session with her. I saw it all happen. Always skeptical of therapy, Emily now seemed nonchalant when Dr. Roberts started the hypnosis procedure and asked her to talk about the events of the night she had been kidnapped. At the beginning, she was sounding so flat as if she were going through the motions of telling how she was walking home when then grabbed by the masked figures. And then something changed. Her voice deepened, took on this eerie, malignant tone. I am not the girl you think I am. She said, now smiling even wider. I must be back to my new home in that cave. My blood ran cold. Before anyone could react, Emily broke out of the trance, her eyes turning the horrible, vacant white again. She lunged at Dr. Roberts, her hand around his throat. John and I pulled her off with all of our strength, but it was like fighting something inhuman. When we finally subdued her, she was unconscious. She was taken back to the hospital, but I knew things were far from over. That night, she escaped. Somehow, even with all the chains and all the sedatives, she managed to get out of the hospital and disappear into the night. The police were called, and once again, we were all out searching for her, this time towards the cave where she had been discovered. But when we arrived there, she was nowhere to be found, and in her place, we found a note written in blood. Don't look for me. I'm with my people now. And from that day forward, Crestwood Town never was the same again. Emily's parents were left shattered, trying to grapple with horror mystery of what happened to their daughter. And I, well, I couldn't stop thinking about the cave, about the last time I saw her, about what really became of my best friend, Emily. Ugh. Oh. I never thought I'd be navigating the dating world again at 30, but after ending a five-year relationship with Mark, I needed a distraction. 
My friends insisted I try Tinder, so one Friday night I sat on my couch in my tiny Chicago apartment swiping through profiles. That's when I matched with Leo. His dark hair, warm brown eyes, and easy smile caught my attention. His bio mentioned a love for jazz music and hiking, both passions of mine. We started chatting and his messages were witty and engaging. After a week of texting, we decided to meet at a downtown cafe. I wore my favorite green sweater, the one that brought out my hazel eyes. Leo was even more charming in person. We laughed over lattes, sharing stories about our favorite concerts and travel adventures. I can't believe you've been to the Montreux Jazz Festival. It's on my bucket list. Maybe someday we can go together. His eyes held a hint of something deeper, but I brushed it off. After two more dates, I realized that while Leo was nice, I wasn't feeling a real connection. Perhaps I wasn't ready to dive into something new. I decided to take a step back. Instead of confronting the situation, I chose the cowardly route. I ghosted him. The guilt gnawed at me, but I hoped he'd understand. But a few days later, messages started coming in from unknown numbers. Hey, haven't heard from you. Everything okay? I ignored them, but the messages kept coming. Did I do something wrong? Please talk to me. Thinking about it would be a drag to explain everything to him. I blocked the numbers, but one morning I found a piece of paper tucked under my car's windshield wiper. I miss seeing your smile. My stomach dropped. How did he find my car? I parked two blocks away from my apartment specifically to avoid parking fees and thought it was anonymous enough. That evening, I found another note taped to my apartment door. We should talk. I scanned the hallway, but it was empty. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up. I double-checked that I locked the door behind me. This is getting out of hand. I called my best friend, Jenna. I think Leo's stalking me. Wait, the Tinder guy? Have you told him to stop? I haven't replied to any of his messages. Maybe I should tell him I'm not interested. I sent Leo a final message. Leo, I'm sorry for the silence. I don't think this is going to work out. Please stop contacting me. He replied almost instantly. Uh, yeah, I figured. Wish you the best. His response was puzzling, but if it meant that he would stop following me, it was good. Over the next week, I found my mailbox stuffed with letters, all in the same handwriting. You're making a mistake. We belong together. Don't ignore me. One night, as I walked home from the train station, I felt someone watching me. Footsteps echoed mine. I glanced back but saw no one. I quickened my pace, heart pounding, and reached my apartment building safely. At 2 a.m., my phone buzzed with a voicemail from another unknown number. You can't hide from me. Sleep was impossible. Every creak and groan of the building made me jump. I decided it was time to involve the authorities. At the police station, Officer Ramirez took my statement. Do you have any evidence that it's this Leo guy? I have the notes and voicemails. I believe it's him. We'll look into it. Feeling helpless, I started looking over my shoulder constantly. One morning, I found my car's windshield broken. That was the final straw. I installed security cameras at my apartment. That night, I settled into bed, clutching a baseball bat for comfort. Around midnight, a loud crash shattered the silence. My living room window was broken. A masked figure climbed through, and just as I nervously peered out, he lunged at me. Adrenaline surged. I swung the bat, connecting with his arm. He grunted but grabbed me, wrestling the bat away. I kicked and screamed, desperately trying to break free. In the struggle, I managed to hit the panic button on my phone's security app. A siren blared, startling the intruder. He bolted out the door, and soon neighbors started opening their doors. Police cars arrived. Officers swarmed the area. Officer Ramirez approached me. They reviewed the security footage. Though the intruder was masked, a small tattoo peeked out from under his sleeve, a familiar design. Do you recognize this tattoo? My breath caught. That's... that's Mark's tattoo. My ex-boyfriend. Confusion flooded me. The officers located Mark at his apartment. 
When they arrested him, he was wearing clothes matching the intruders. At the station, the truth unraveled. Mark confessed to everything. He had installed a spyware in my phone and kept track of my meeting with Leo. But once I ghosted Leo, he intensified his efforts to scare me, hoping I'd run back to him for comfort. I had to make you see that you still need me. I was protecting you from the dangers out there. I felt sick. He looked at me with a twisted sense of righteousness. I did it for us. In the aftermath, restraining orders were filed. Jenna moved in temporarily to help me feel safer, but the betrayal cut deep. I deleted the dating apps and focused on rediscovering myself, picking up old hobbies, reconnecting with friends, and embracing solitude. Life moved forward, and so did I, one step at a time. 